Yeah. Uh, in the state of California, you cannot buy the light bulbs that we have used in here all along. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a much different, brighter white light, and actually the uh, there's some kind of a government program. They're trying to get all the incandescent bulbs out, so they'll give you these. So, uh, yeah. Now, I don't know what happens when they go out, but they're all LEDs. So, you know, we're saving the polar bears, I suppose, because, uh, you know, using less power, which is all, that's good, you know. Electricity is expensive, so if this saves a little bit of money. I, frankly, I, I kind of like pure, brighter light. Will it be help, easier to, to read in here? Or is that? All right, so can't be all bad. Well, there you have it. So um, now, guys, men's retreat coming up here in a couple of weeks. Can you believe that? September the 11th, 12th, 13th. If you're signed up, great. Uh, if you put in a deposit but you need to pay off the balance, you can do that tonight. Uh, if you're not signed up and uh, are kicking around whether you should go, I'll answer that question for you. You should go. And uh, why that is, um, this will be really a, a, an amazing retreat to go to. Um, content and all the rest of it, I think it's, it's going to be, it's all the stuff that we were talking about when I got saved 30 years ago. And, uh, and that a lot of times isn't really talked about much anymore. But what was it that was, was such an exciting thing to us as, as new believers? We've kind of, uh, in these later years, it seems like we've gotten lulled into a just kind of, eh, we're settled in kind of a thing. And uh, it'll be kind of cool to reestablish some of the, the things that we were talking about back then and, uh, and why it's important to always be in a place of expectation and the things that God was doing back then, I'd love to see him doing those same things around here, but he takes willing participants. So guys, if you want to come out and see what it was like when we used to do retreats way back when, this is going to be definitely one of those kind of things to see. And um, again, that, those are the things that helped me to put roots down around this place. That's why I'm still here after all these years, because uh, the roots go deep when you, uh, it's just not, not, God has not called us to superficial things. In fact, what we look at tonight is the danger of superficial things. And so uh, interesting the way that this would have looked to my eyes 30 years ago, this passage that we're looking at tonight, as opposed to how it looks to my eyes in 2015. So uh, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit on that as we, uh, as we get into this. Uh, what other, do we have anything else uh, uh, announcement-wise? Anybody? Anything? Okay. So men's retreat, 11th, 12th, 13th. Um, we're putting together, I'll put it up on the website too. It's a, just a list of what you'll need to bring. And um, then, uh, let me see, is there anything else with that? I think that that's pretty much it. There will be a couple of guys I think who are going to need to have rides up there. So guys, if there are any of you that are headed up and think you got room in your car, let me know so that we can work out trying to get some guys up there that may need a ride. I know of a, at least two or three guys that will need a, a ride up. So enough for the announcements. With that, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Iconic chapter because of how it starts in the last days. So that always gets people excited, right? You know, it's an interesting thing because I've heard it so many times. I've heard people do Bible studies on this particular chapter. And uh, I, I think it's, it's an important thing to do. And um, one of the, the things that sometimes I've heard people try to, um, try to, to do is to look at society as a whole. And uh, you'll find these kinds of people throughout history, no question, and we have plenty of them around, but there's something that Paul has to say about them a few verses into the chapter that put them in a different category, and, and uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But I want to remember what Paul had just left in chapter 2 and what he had to say to us there by talking about the vessels of honor and how they would be useful to God and those kinds of things that are said because chapter 3 comes to him as a warning. So remember, it's about the impeccable character of this vessel of honor that we studied last time that we were together. And then when we get to chapter 3, he says, know this, in the last days, perilous times are coming. And so uh, they are times of, of peril and danger and all the rest of it. But remember who it is that he's writing to, and remember when it was that he was writing. That is 
hugely important. Do I think that when Paul wrote this, he was thinking about our day? I don't think he was thinking two year, or 2,000 years down the road. And so it, he's not saying any of these things to try to set a date. What he's trying to do is say, when those times come, here are some of the things that you'll be able to see as characteristic. Now, interestingly enough, the examples, I think if we look back historically over the last 2,000 years, we could probably find plenty of examples because these things have been going on all the time. But it does, I can definitely say this, in my time as a believer, the, the, uh, the fables that we see being put out are more fanciful. And the one benefit now that we have, or that the, the, the false teachers, I should say, have now is that they can get their message out worldwide instantaneously. And that's never really quite been like it is right now. You know, I was thinking about even when, uh, considering that when, it, when I was thinking about going up to the retreat, uh, some of the things that guys will ask me, well, should we bring jackets? Should we do this? Should we do that? I said, you know, I'm thinking to myself, check your smartphone and, and check the weather up there. And, uh, you know, you can do it right from where you're sitting. You'll know what the weather's going to be like a couple of days before you even go up there. You know what the highs and the lows projected are, and they're usually going to be pretty close. <laughs> the last time I was at this facility, I didn't even know what the Internet was. So to, to go and to check a, a weather report uh, was just, just, there was no such thing. If you'd have told me, well, just jump on the Internet and Google it or check your smartphone, I'd have to say, what are you talking about? That stuff wasn't even created. So that just tells us where, where we are in human history. It's a, it's a pretty interesting time. With all that said, what Paul is doing here is writing to a young man, Timothy, 2,000 years ago, first century. So when we get to the various things that Paul says to Timothy, we need to remember the time in which he was writing this. And some of the things that he says here need to be taken in the context of to whom he is speaking and especially where. This is at Ephesus. Remember, let's, let's remember that. So when we go to look at it in terms of where we are right here, right now in history, there are a little bit of differences in application that we can make. But the overall spiritual truth still remains. And that will hopefully become really clear as we go through this. So with all of that said, let's have a, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump into our text. Father, we thank you so much for bringing us to this place tonight. We thank you for your word. We're grateful, Lord, that you have given us these bits and pieces of, of warning. Of course, they would have meant something to Timothy. They certainly mean something to us now, since no one knows the day nor the hour. We don't know when your return is. We are to be, of course, discerning, though. And so we pray, God, that you would give us discerning hearts and minds, that by your Spirit you would help us to understand how these words and what is being said here to Timothy does affect us today and how we ought to operate in the midst of such a time. So we thank you for gathering us here, and we pray that you would glorify yourself through the teaching of your word this evening, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now... What you'll see as Paul lays all of this out, this is um, what you would call, or what you would say, Paul is really calling Timothy to a place of <clears throat> discerning things. Discern the times in which you live and pay attention to the cautions that are here. Interestingly enough, there are a number of people, and I, I like to consider myself among them, who believe that not just as what I do as a pastor, but times when I go outside of here, there are times that God gives me uh, opportunity to go and share at places about discernment. And when you hear the word discernment, it, just, it should very simply mean this, paying attention to the times in which you live, especially when you consider it in light of what's going on in the name of God through the churches. So interestingly enough, if you take that kind of a ministry on, you get people angry at you. And a lot of times people will mock what they call discernment ministries. And I'm thinking to myself, since when did discernment become a bad thing? Because right here Paul is, is telling Timothy these things as a warning. Now, we're going to notice, and, and it's, it's always important to look at the big picture when we're, when we're looking at a particular section here. Because what we're looking at is the first nine verses tonight. But for the whole chapter, remember, by looking just at the first couple of words at verse 10, look what it says. But you, Timothy, you have carefully followed. So Timothy is going to stand in total stark contrast to the characteristics that are being mentioned in the first nine verses. 
And so as we begin this chapter, he says to Timothy the first thing, know this, be aware, be careful to recognize that in the last days, times of peril, there are times of danger that are coming and he's going to explain why. Now, of course, when you see the list of things, and I wrote down you know, some of the, the, the word meanings of these things so that I could give you kind of the synonyms to it, we will look at these and think, okay, well, that sounds like the world and it sounds like it's always been you know, that way. But again, what he ends up saying about who he's uh, uh, saying these things about is when it becomes an interesting problem. So with that being said, let's take a look at verse 1. It says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. So, of course, this is the question. When are the last days? Everybody's been speculating on it. It was speculated on when I first got saved. We're in the last days. Nobody thought we'd get out of the 80s, and we got out of the 80s. Well, we won't make it out of the 90s, and we did. We won't make it out of the 2000s. Hey, we won't make it past Y2K. And I remember, I remember that whole thing, you know, and I, I bought in to some extent. I didn't, I didn't go out and I still don't have food, you know, from those times. And we didn't do all of that stuff. And, but, you know, we were watching, how many of you guys stayed up uh, New Year's Eve um, from 99 to 2000 to see if everything went off? There were a lot who did. And, and we were wondering what would happen. Little tiny glitches here and there, but it was nothing like what it was billed to be. But everybody was sure that that was the end of days. And I remember when we first went into Iraq that that was going to be the end of things because, you know, there's Babylon and, you know, it, it, we run to and fro and we get, you know, really tied up with things. Well, here he says, end of days. So when that's going to be, of course, that's known to God. Here are some of the characteristics that he talks about with people. So, yeah, these have always been around with us. What I do find interesting is how, I had said earlier, that how fanciful the stories are becoming as we get closer to when the Lord returns and how easy it is to get that message out. It's without precedent. Now, what will it look like when the Lord returns? Are we really, really close? I, you know, it's always felt that way to me and, and it's demonstrated that God's a whole lot more patient than I would be. But I do know this, that eventually he comes back and he's given us a, a number of different ways to, to recognize when that's going to be. And here are some of the things that he has to say about that. And here's why. The last days. Times of peril are going to come. And he gives two things right up front. Men will be lovers of themselves and they'll be lovers of money. Now, he goes on with a whole litany of things that he says about them. Now, the important thing for us to recognize, there are two things, and again, I wrote down all the little synonyms here, so I'll get those for you. Um, the idea of, of lovers of self is pretty interest, er, It's pretty obvious. It's just self-interest. What is in it for me? Now, here's an interesting thing, and this is something that I've definitely noticed in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. When I first got saved, never did it enter the mind of, well, if I get saved, what's in it for me? Did any of you do that when you first got saved? Visit a lot of churches and it's kind of like, well, come and be a part of this church. We're going to make your life better. We're going to do this. We're going to be involved with this, that, or the other thing. And it's all about you. And that's okay because God's attention is definitely on those that he died to save. There's no doubt about that. But the church, why is it here? It isn't all about you. It's all about him and you needing to know who he is and what he did for you that you could be saved, but it's not a bed of roses potentially. Look at what it's like to be a believer elsewhere in the world. So to think that somehow we have it better here or deserve something better here than elsewhere in the world, that's delusional. And that is fleeting because the day may very well come when it's not going to be convenient here. And frankly, I think that's the best thing that would ever happen to the church here because you'd get rid of the just pretenders and you would get to the genuine. Now, he's going to talk about pretenders here in this verse. But he says, as the first of the things, what's in it for me? The people who are lovers of self, lovers of themselves. Now, they're also going to be lovers of money. They're going to be covetous people. It's not enough just to have what they have. They want what other people have. May very, may very well be because of envy, but that becomes something that they strive for. Now, here's one of the funny things about it. When it comes to, I want this and I want that, we can see that as being something that you strive for. Since I want, I'm going to pursue after. But think about it this way. Why would you have a pursuit after something like that if you're not first and foremost a lover of yourself? 
If I love me, I want to take care of me. And if I want to take care of me, I want what I want. You see how it's all very self-centered? Now, we think of this as far as the world is concerned, do we not? This is what we expect of the unsaved. But think about it in the way of the professing people who profess themselves to be believers. You're going to notice this. It would be easy to make, you know, insert the politician joke here. Because look at all the things that are going to be said about these people. And we think, yeah, politicians. And of course, it's, you know, presidential season now. And so we're going to be treated to this for the next year and a couple of months. But you're going to notice here that he says, these are people who have a form of godliness. That's what makes this different. These are people parading themselves as believers. Now, most of the political class, they'll pay lip service to the things of God. You know, God bless the United States and all the rest of it. They're the most ungodly people you've ever seen. They say it because it fits on a bumper sticker. But how many of them profess a personal relationship with the God of the universe? Not very many. Very few. They can pay lip service. So we're not talking about the unsaved, even the political class here. We're talking about the TV preacher kind of guy. That's the ones that we're talking about here. We're talking about the pretenders, the imposters. So the first of these signs of these people, self-centered, what's in it for me? Think about the guys. You can go see them tonight or you can go watch them tonight if you're so inclined. I don't suggest you do it. But catch the late night preachers. And they're going to tell you about all the things that God has revealed to them and he wants to reveal to you if you will just send, your, send in your money. Well, isn't that about self? I want you to know what I want to know, but it's going to cost you. Well, that's because you're a lover of self, Mr. Preacher Guy. If you're, if you're really saved, you got that for free. Now you want to charge to give it back out? Shyster. So, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, covetous people. Then he goes on and he says this. They are also boasters. They are, the, the, the word here means like they're wanderers. These are people going about trying to pump themselves up, making themselves of some kind of reputation. They'll go anywhere that they can to promote themselves. Boasters. God has given me a secret word for you, brother. And then, have you, have you guys ever given to a ministry and for like the next five years, every two weeks or so, you get something in the mail from them? Some cheesy bit of, you know, a package of sand from the Holy Land or oil or water or some crazy thing like that? You, seriously, how many of you guys have ever received that stuff? Yeah. Hey, it's marketing. And, man, if you ever send a second gift, forget it. You will have enough mail to last you the rest of your life. So, this is the kind, this is the variety of people. These ones who tell you that they've got inside information. How about those ones where, I mean, they're sending this out to hundreds of thousands of people. I prayed for you this morning. Really? Did you ever find time to eat or even, you know, shower? Because if you're, if you're praying for all those people, my goodness, you must be a busy man. How many of you guys remember the whole Nightline thing like 20 years ago where they found all that stuff that was sent back in, just torn up and thrown in a trash can, but they took the money out? You guys remember that? Do you remember that? Those jokers are still around. And you'll notice their targets are mentioned here as well. So these are people who are boasters and they are also proud. They put themselves above others. There's an arrogance about them. Well, I know that that guy down the street's got his thing going on, but we've got it better. And so it's always getting bigger and better and it's more you know, entertaining and bring them in. We're doing stuff that no one else is doing. And isn't it funny that the more that people are doing something else, the less they're getting into the word. Isn't that weird? I have had people say, you know, so what's your, what does your church do with this, that, and the other thing? And, and uh, you know, what, how does, what is a church service like yours? What do you guys do? And so you know, we'll tell them, well, on Sunday mornings we get together and we have worship, a couple of services, and we're studying through the book of Revelation or whatever it is that we're studying through at the time. Well, what about your midweek, your small groups, your this, that, and the other thing? Well, we have fellowships for men and women and a couple of things like that, but we all get together as a congregation. We study through the New Testament on Wednesday nights and the Old Testament on Sunday nights. And yeah, every book, we go through it all. Really? And they're surprised. Well, what about this and what about that? And interestingly enough, I had this conversation with, uh, with some people just over the weekend and saying to them that uh, what if a person who didn't have eyesight came into those churches? What would they take away from that? If you can't take it in with those senses and all that you can do is, is hear, 
None of that stuff matters, does it? They're not going to be impressed by the size of the place or the lighting or the screens or any of the rest of that. They're going to go strictly on the content. Interesting how that works. And yet the church is moving away from content because it's all the visual stuff. Well, again, that fits right into people being boastful and lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of things, and then the idea of being prideful. But notice that he puts in this blasphemers. This is abusive in speaking evil. Now again, I expect that of the world, but hold on to your hats because of what he says about these people. So when we think about how is it that a church would blaspheme God? Well, they don't need to be profane. They don't need to use foul language, but you can speak evil of God by misrepresenting him in total. That somehow God is like a vending machine. That if you say the right different things and put in the right different things and pull the lever, you're going to get whatever you want. And that's being sold out there. There are ways that God is grossly misrepresented by such people. Now notice what else he says. These are also people who are disobedient. And he mentions towards parents. But this disobedience means that they're not compliant. You can't persuade them. You can't win them to your side of things. No matter what you say, they will not be swayed. And so as he mentions... These are people who are dis disobedient even to parents, but authorities even might be another way that you could put it too, because we think of, uh, maybe a better way of saying it is elders, those who would be in a, a place of older or authority to them. In this case, he mentions them as parents. And then it says, now these are also people who are unthankful. There's no graciousness. There's no pleasing them. Now think about all of these characteristics and remember that this could be said of each one of us, certainly in our days before we were saved, and from time to time we may exhibit all of these things here and there. But notice that there is always, or should always be, whenever these things creep in, what should happen to us is a, a place of recognition, acknowledgement before God, repentance, and allow him to restore us from that and say, these things are offensive to you, God. I don't ever want to be in this position. So forgive me for whatever of these things. These people that are being spoken of here have no desire for such things or else they would not be blasphemous towards the things of God. goes on and it says they were also... Um, unholy. And so the un unholy is the wickedness and the profane. I remember in years, and this is one of the things that has always struck me, people that profess to be believers but use some of the most, let's use it, uh, let's say flowery language you'd ever hear. And you just think, man, I used to talk like that before I was saved. Some of the most profane things come from their mouth and they're unfazed by it. And yet, I remember a, a place uh, with a guy that I used to work with. And in the office, everybody knew that this guy was involved around ministry and all the rest of it. And sometimes he would use the exact same vulgar language as the rest of the people in his office. And I thought, you're totally blowing your witness, dude. That's so uncool. Now, it's one thing if that goes on in your mind, like, you know, smack your finger with a hammer and, you, you know, you're thinking all kinds of expletives, right? Verbalizing them is a different thing entirely, especially whatever it is that may get you upset. Verbalizing it in front of people who are going to be able to hear it. Let's remember, you can undo so much good stuff with just one outburst. I've watched it. I've, in my early years, that was one of my toughest things. How do you bridle the tongue? It may very well be going on up here. It doesn't need to be going on out there. And then you pray, God, help my heart that I'm not so reactionary. But here they are, these people who are unholy. And so that idea of being wicked or even profane, this lack of holiness, this, lank, this lack of being sanctified or set apart, obviously godly, there's a, there's a lack of those things. Now it says in verse 3, these are people who are also, they're unloving. These are people without, if you're reading Old King James, I believe it is without natural affection, where we would think about sociopathic. People who have no care whatsoever for what happens to someone else. We saw it, and again, we have to remember the context here. Be very, very careful. Paul, writing to Timothy at Ephesus, beware of the people around Ephesus, parading themselves as believers. But, you know, we were all pretty shocked probably at what we saw today with the, the violence in Virginia, right? That's sociopathic. You have no concern. And the guy videotapes it like he's playing a video game. If you guys have seen it, 
he had some kind of a camera, like a GoPro or who knows what on him, but all that you see is the gun and he's recording himself shooting those people. Like there's, there's nothing there. Talk about a deadness of soul. It's unbelievable. Well, it tells us that these are the kinds of people who will also be operating inside of the church. Now, these are people that are also considered as unforgiving. Uh, oh, the King James, I believe, is truce breakers. So if you could find some way to say, let's call a truce. Let's, let's not fight any longer. Let's not do this. These would be people that even if you could get them to agree to it, they would be the ones who would break it. So the idea of truce breaking, kind of like Iran. <laughs> okay, I know. Truce breakers, those ones who are unforgiving. They have no, no intention of breaking with the hostilities, and even if they did it for some reason, it wouldn't be genuine and they would break it. These are also people referred to as slanderers or people that accuse falsely, false accusers, making the case against someone without merit, without truthfulness behind it. So slanderers, and they're also people who are without self-control. It means basically unrestrained. So there's nothing that can hold them back from doing the things that they want to do. Now, if you start to look at this as just an avalanche of attributes, you'll probably notice whoever it is that this is being spoken of probably exemplifies all of these things in some way or another. And I'll be honest with you, growing up, you know, as, as a kid, I don't think I would have been like this. But I could see myself easily turning this way. I got saved at 20 years old, and I thank God for it. Because I could see myself having the ability to do all of these things. This is, unfortunately, this is in our nature. Now, the thing that gets really interesting is what he's about to say once again. The idea that these are people that would you would... Um, see around churches. Well, these are people who are also referred to as brutal, and this means like savage or fierce. I think of the people that, uh, that wanted at Jesus when it says that they came at him and they gnashed at him. They did the same thing at Paul. They were so furious with what was being said, all that they could think to do was to bite. And think about it. When we were kids, didn't we do this? We, don't, we get in arguments with people nowadays. We don't bite them anymore, but we did when we were kids, Right? Did any of you ever bite the people that you were mad at? Oh, you're all lying. You did too. <laughs> Come on. It's the first thing you can think about. Animals do that. That's what animals do. My, my cat just had to have surgery for an abscess, and we got one of those funnels on his head. You know how they really they hate that? They can't walk. It, yeah, he's miserable. But every time I pick him up, I'm just thinking, he's going to bite me. Or he's going to get me with claws because he's going to blame me for that when I had nothing to do with it. Well, we've seen people act that way. Do anything that they can just because of their fury and their, their rage. So these are people who, they're without any kind of self-control. They're brutal. They're also despisers of that which is good. They're hostile towards virtue and good things. So again, it's easy to find examples of this outside of the church. I mean, have you guys watched the Planned Parenthood videos? Man, I just can't grasp that level of wickedness. And yet, think Paul warning Timothy, you, Timothy, in the church there. And let's go even larger in the context. Paul realizes he is at the latter part of his life. And he's trying to warn Timothy, Timothy, pay attention because perilous times are coming. He's expecting that this is going to be taking place at Ephesus. And he figures that not far down the road, the Lord's going to return because these are the characteristics. Again, if, if, I don't believe for a moment that Paul expected there to be 2,000 years of history after his writings. Or else, when he talked to the church there at, uh, at Philippi, when he talked about the, the dead in Christ rising first, then we who are alive will be caught up with them. I think he believed that the harpaz, or the, if you will, the rapture, was going to happen in his lifetime. So he was off by a few years. A couple thousand to be exact, but he's off. So I don't think he expected this to go on, but he's telling Timothy, just know, this is going to be the condition of the church going forward, and he refers to those as perilous times. So again, eras of history have come and gone. We're centuries, millennia, two millennia since the writing of this roughly, and that time has ebbed and flowed. We've had these people come in and out of the church, and it may very well be 
that we will live to some ripe old age and a whole nother group of people start church and all the rest of it. And these people will be present with them too. But the idea is to always be careful because really ultimately what Paul wants is for him to be under uh, aware of it, recognize it, and then he has a prescription to what you do when you identify these people and that's the important part. I don't want to use a verse like this and say, and since it's happening in the church, Jesus is coming back next year or next month, as some people think. I personally don't know when, don't know how. I don't know a lot of that stuff. Here are some characteristics of what people will be like, and you would figure that it would be somewhat worse than it has been when he comes back. When it is, no clue. But I am to be aware, and if they are happening in the church, then again, as it says, he has this prescription. So these are people who are just despisers of that which is good, that which is virtuous. And again, think about the stuff that is now beginning to be celebrated in the church. We, are, we have seen churches, and we expected it with the very liberal denominations, but even now... In what used to be solid churches, they're now starting to have the discussion about what is acceptable even to the things like marriage and that type of a situation. Who would have thought maybe 20 years ago that the church would be openly discussing the redefinition of marriage? And I, I, I love this. That people like to call us fundamentalists or whatever they want to. Look, God has not changed his opinion. His opinion was in place thousands of years ago. So I don't care what the culture says. It's irrelevant. Let the culture do what the culture is going to do. Let society do what society is going to want to do. The church is immovable in this. Now, if the church believes that it should be movable, then that's on them. Because God has not changed his mind about a variety of topics that are now being discussed openly. Well, to me, that's where we're starting to get to the place where the church is beginning to despise that which is good or virtuous. And God's the one who sets that standard, by the way. So, it goes on. Now, these are also people who are referred to as traitors. Or these are people who will readily betray. They'll say one thing, but is the moment that it becomes convenient for them to do it, they will betray the people that are there with them. So, traitors. These are also people who are headstrong. This is one of those great Greek words. It means that they're falling forward. Now, we've seen people like, you know, that you'll catch your, your toe as you're walking and it pitches you forward. And how many times have you seen people that are running and they do that and it takes five, six steps and they're like just about catching themselves and then finally just, ugh, they fall over, right? This means that they are headlong or they are stumbling forward. Because they're so locked in on what they do that they're looking down, you know, think of a person that's falling forward. That usually doesn't end well, does it? Sooner or later, something gets in your way, a curb, a wall, another person. <laughs> but this idea of being headstrong or headlong, running, falling forward, it's a great image that you see of that. But again, that, that shows such a lack of control, does it not? Which is what it's supposed to give you in its imagery. Falling forward, lack of control. These are also people who are referred to as haughty. Now, this is the same description that he gives in 1 Timothy chapter 3 when it talks about qualifications for elders to make sure that they are not haughty. And we hear that word puffed up, right? Now, we think puffed up, my mind instantly goes to pastry, right? Because, hey, food's great visual, isn't it? Throw something in that's got lots of little flaky layers and they're just so yummy and you throw them into the, into the oven and they puff up. And that's what we think about, right? This puff up means more like they're just this cloud of smoke. When we think puff of smoke, they're just vapor. They're just a cloud. That's what's being referred to here when he talks about these people that are haughty. Everything is about them. It's about appearance. It's just this puff of smoke. So he says, first of all, don't let those people into leadership in 1 first, in first Timothy 3. And now he says in 2 Timothy 3, this is one of the characteristics of these deceivers, these imposters. Same kind of thing. Same word. Very, very interesting. Well, he says these are also people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And it's a great play on words here. Now, this is not 
agapeo. This is not the verb of love, like the perfection, not even perfection, but the intensity of it. This is more like you're having a casual relationship with, or you have an affection or affinity towards. So these are people who have, if you will, a, a fondness towards pleasure. Now, it's, it's a hyphenated word, and I wrote it down. It's uh, uh, philodonos. Now, what that means, when you hear donos, think hedonism. They're having this excitement towards the things of the flesh, the hedonism. What do I want? How do I exercise these things? So they're people that on the outward may appear godly, but they want the things that are the desires of their flesh. Now, that's what they want, because they are lovers. They have an affection for those things rather than an affection for the things of God. So they will give themselves over to that stuff rather than give themselves over to the things of God. Now, Jesus uses a little bit more direct language on this. In John 3.16, we all know the verse, God so loved, it's an action, agapeo. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How do we know that he loved the world? What's the intensity of his love? He sent Jesus to die on a cross to save mankind. Now, a few verses later, verse 19 is where it says, but men love darkness. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Same word, agapeo. So isn't that amazing? Everybody usually when you hear agape or agapeo, when they, an action, that's the verb form of it. When they love something, we always think, well, agape is God's love. I've heard that said a million times. Oh, agape, that's God's love. Really? People that love darkness have that same kind of love. It is the quality and the intensity of the love rather than the person who employs it. So same kind of a thing here. All they can, are concerned with are all the things that are just being said about them, but because they were first of all lovers of self and wanted anything that they could get covetously to satisfy self because they had a love and affection for the things of this life rather than a love for the things of God. Now, when we hear all of that, we think, okay, Paul's talking about the world. Well, look at what he says in verse 5. These are people having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Well, that puts them in a totally different category, doesn't it? Because these are people who may very well be professing believers, but this is what is said about them. So again, this is why context is so very, very important to us to understand. Paul writing to Timothy at Ephesus. Paul saying, Timothy, I'm about out of here. Now here's what you need to be aware of at Ephesus. People are going to come up and they're going to demonstrate these things in their actions, but they're going to try to make people believe that they are believers. And I've mentioned it before. Remember, this is the same Ephesus that at an earlier time, Paul met with the elders, the overseers, and told them, no sooner do I get on that boat to leave to Jerusalem, guys, wolves are going to come in and they won't spare the flock. They're not only going to be from outside of the church, but they're going to pop up from within. So you guys are responsible. You make sure of it. Take care of the flock. By the time that he's writing, or he has these things with Timothy, he leaves Timothy in place less than a decade later and he's telling him, basically, clear the deck. Start all over. New overseers, new bishops, new elders, because here's the problem. And he's repeating himself what he would have been saying to the Ephesian elders. Same church, same warning, different time, different person making that warning. Pretty heavy stuff if you think about it. What that also should let us know is never let your guard down. Just because things are doing well in a church at a particular time, don't expect it'll be better next week, next month, next year. Always be on guard. There's a vigilance that needs to take place. And that's what you're going to notice as we get into next week where he says, but you, Timothy, you stand as a total contrast to these guys. So remember this litany of things that are said about these imposters, these people parading themselves out as being believers, but are nothing of the sort. Because you're going to get next week where Paul says, but you're a different sort. And then he explains why. Because all scripture is given by God and it is profitable. Now, these are people that have these characteristics. They don't give a, a rip about the word of God. They don't care about such things. Remember, they're loving self. They don't love God. They love what they can get for themselves. And then they start to demonstrate this, this 
lack of love for God by their actions, what we've just studied through. So, these are people who have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And so what do you do with these people? Well, you sit down and have coffee with them. You know, you don't want to become judgmental. So you try to win them over to your side. You try to just reason with them. You know what? Then at this point, you're trying to be God to them because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. They're in their error. You avoid them. Look at what he says here. You are to, from such people, you are to turn away. It's not to even be identified with them. And again, this is one of the things happening in the church. It makes me nuts. We are supposed to somehow, hey, if we agree on a whole bunch of stuff, the things that we disagree on, let's just all do things together. Well, you know, it's funny because oftentimes the same people that we're told to embrace just wait a little while because they're going to really start to show more of their characteristics. And then the guy that you were promoting last week, you don't want anything to do with him this week because he's really come full bloom. So, you know important to know a person very thoroughly before you're going to jump on stage with them or promote them in any way. When you find people that start to be characteristic of some of these things, parading themselves as being one of you. Remember, that's what we saw. They have this form of godliness. Exterior, they're a hollow shell, though, because what's going on inside? We see what they project on the outside, but what's happening inside? Are they the real deal or are they an imposter? I don't know. What are their characteristics like? What do they believe in their doctrinal views? Now, what we're noticing in this, these are purveyors of false truth, as we're going to find out in just a moment. Because verse 6 says, For of this sort, they are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. Now, oh Paul, you're such a sexist. You're such a misogynist. I've heard all kinds of things said about him. Look, he's talking about Ephesus. He's talking about Timothy. He's talking about some cultural stuff that's going on that is very specific to Ephesus, though we don't know all the ins and outs of it. So since I don't know that, I don't know why he singled them out, but of course when he said this to Timothy, it would have really meant something. It was a different society there. It was a different part of the world. It was a different time. How about now we go ahead and say, how do we make an application of that today? Because first of all, I see lots of deception in the church and it wipes out men and women alike. The guys that are capitalizing on this are the ones that creep in because of maybe their words or maybe they're telling such fanciful stories, all the rest of those kind of things. The deception in the church is weirder than at any time I can remember. The things that are being accepted as mainstream back when we wouldn't have even, first of all, they weren't even on the map yet. But if we'd have heard about some of that stuff 10, 15, 20 years ago, we'd have kind of laughed about it. Now the, the new rage is a lot of Eastern-oriented ministry-type things, methodologies, spiritual practices, and all the rest of that, that even 20 years ago, yeah, they were there, but they weren't on the forefront. Now we have people that are doing all kinds of signs and wonders. That's the new big thing. Now that started in the early 90s to hit mainstream. It's really gone out there now. You've heard me talk about it. But do I, am I trying to you know, springboard and make a case for it? Well, look at how he uses as an example here. These are the type they creep in. They creep into people who are lacking discernment. And so when people, if you hear them talking down discernment, you want to look at them and say, you're part of the problem. If you cannot identify the problem that is in front of you, you are susceptible to the deception that's being spoken of. How do you avoid it? Paul's going to explain that next week. But the idea of discerning things. Hey, somebody said something. It sounded great. I hope it's true. But is it biblical? How do you know if what's being taught is accurate? Do you know it in the Word of God? Can you prove it to be false or true based upon the Word of God? Because that's your standard. And he's going to make that case at the latter part of this chapter. So, you know, all in context, we'll go back to it next week. But if somebody tries to creep in, it's like you kind of, you know, these people work their way in. And think of how many people get milked out of millions by the, the creepy preachers on television. How many people do you hear about all the stuff that they've sent, all the money that they've invested and all the rest of it, thinking that there's some benefit to them? Well, they, these people are the ones that capitalize on such people. And they're still among us today. Now, 
he goes on and explains these people they're always learning but they're never able to come to a knowledge of the truth and there's the debate about well is that talking about the ladies or is that talking about the other guys and basically you could say it, it really is a commentary on anyone who could be led astray by these things but as it as it is notice that there has already been introduced into this discussion Paul says you avoid those guys when you think about what he said in Romans chapter 16 when he says you mark those who cause division based upon what based upon doctrine and the same thing he says here, you mark them, recognize who they are, call them out by name, and have nothing to do with them, don't identify with them. Same thing he says to Timothy here. Paul was very big on discerning. He was careful about the well-being of the church and of the people, knowing that if God had a love for the sheep, then we also know that there's always an opposite side of things, and there is a great hatred that the devil has for those which God loves. And to somehow try to convince ourselves that he doesn't is just naive in the extreme. So just know that for every genuine, the enemy is always going to try to come up with some kind of a counterfeit, and he's looking for the weak to pick off. How do we avoid that weakness? Discerning, knowing the word of God, being able to use it as the prism through which you look at everything. Again, it's what he says in the, the rest of the chapter, which we will get to next week. But let's finish off this part. Now, he gives us a couple of guys from their history. Now, this is interesting because um, we've all seen the Ten Commandments, right? So, of course, we know when, uh, when Carradine walks in and he throws down his staff in front of uh, Yule Brenner that uh, his staff turns into a snake and then in comes the other two guys and they throw down their rods. Remember that whole thing? Okay, how many, how many of you guys are tracking with me here? The rest of you haven't seen the Ten Commandments. Okay. We don't know the names of these guys. You can go back to Exodus, and they're not mentioned by name. Here Paul mentions them, and it's caused speculation. Um, were, this really, were, were these their names? I don't suppose that they probably wore name tags. You know, I'm the magician Janus, and I'm the magician Jambres. And Paul mentions them, and it may very well be because of the names that he gives to them, it may speak more of their characteristic. And uh, uh, one means seducer or vexer, and the other one means um, uh, deceiver, something along those lines. So here's what the tradition held, that, that, was, that they had names of them and they carried it down through their history, but you can't track it through the Bible. It's more by tradition. So regardless, we do know that those guys were there, two of the magicians that showed up. And so the bigger picture, it's so funny because people get, well, what do their names mean? Are those their real names or are they just names? You, you want to step back and say, well, wait a minute. They were able to do the parlor tricks. That's the important part. What God did by having Aaron's rod bud was a supernatural thing and it was what God wanted to do. But the imposters came in, these empty shells that seemed to be able to do the same kind of supernatural things until, you know, uh, the <laughs> God's, uh, God's snake ate the other two, call it that, you know, if we want to go by what we saw in the movie. But you can go back and take a look at it. Was a, it was a demonstration of who was who. The devil knows how to play a parlor trick as well as anybody else. Okay, And he will do so and really parlay that in the end times to get a lot of people to follow after him because he'll do things that no one else has done. So, yeah, it's impressive. Let's remember, this is, I mean, he was as magnificent as anything that God had ever created, Satan was, when he was Lucifer. Son of the morning was one of his titles. He was impressive. So to think that he can't do the supernatural, I mean, come on. The devil's a deceiver he has been from the beginning. So the idea that he would raise up people who would purport themselves to be one thing but actually be another thing entirely, that's exactly what we should expect. It shouldn't be a surprise. So we see Janus and, Jan or Janus and Jambres. They resisted Moses. So do these also resist the truth, these men who come in and do these things. These are men of corrupt minds. Now, this corruption means that they're just broken. Now, it's not an adjective. It's not a description. It means that it's an action, rather. And it's their mind is diseased. It's gone. In fact, he ends up saying that they're disapproved. That means reprobate. Now, when you hear word reprobate, what does that mean? What's a reprobate? 
Interestingly enough, there are a few different words. I remember asking Jack years ago a question about, you know, the, the, the hypothetical, can a person lose their salvation? I remember asking that question. And Jack was so good about this kind of stuff. He wasn't, well, pull up a chair and I'll explain it to you. He, he put it back on me. He said, I want you to go back and identify four groups of people for me and then come back and tell me what your answer is. Okay, Jack, what are those four people? He said, tell me what is a Christian. Tell me what is a person that is backslidden. Tell me what is an apostate. And tell me what is a reprobate. And then you come back and talk to me. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the rest of that. When we get to the book of Hebrews, I'll go through that stuff with you. But when I looked up what a reprobate was, this is a person who was never saved, never could be saved. This was a person who would never make a decision for the Lord no matter what you tried to do. Now, they're a hollow shell. They have a form of godliness. But there was no way that they were ever going to get saved. These are people of a diseased, disapproved, reprobate way. Why? Because their way was corrupt. So there was nothing that could be done. They were never going to come to... And this, of course, gets to that big debate. Well, did God make them that way? No. Every person is you know, on their way to hell anyway. Let's make sure we understand that. But I am of the school of thought that if God's going to pick and choose, then... Boy, that becomes a real problem of his justice. So these people that were never going to come to that belief, God already knew it. But he says about these people, they were never going to get it together. Now, in verse 9 it says, but they will progress no further. Why? Well, because their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Well, Janus and Jambres. They tried to do their thing and for a moment it looked like they were able to do the same thing that God was doing until God brought their work to nothing. Now, here's the sad part about it. Does that mean that God won't even let the whole thing get started? No, no, he's already said these are the kind of people that go into, you know, these lazy people that are undiscerning and they get in there. So it's going to have its, its way in church and it, it always has. These people who profess to be something, but what they're selling is something that is so unbiblical, but the undiscerning are able to be led astray by it because they don't take the time to verify what they hear based upon the Word of God. They just take it at face value. Now, you've heard me say it a million times if you've been here for any length of time. Honestly, and I really sincerely mean this, you, you check everything that you ever hear over the pulpit here. Please do. Everything that we study, you check it for yourself. Because here's the cool thing about it. You, with your Bible and the Holy Spirit, have all the authority that you need. God will be able to validate anything that is ever said based upon his word. Because it was in place before I was ever born. God wasn't waiting around to tell me what was right and wrong and you know, just dish it out to everyone else. That's crazy. We get together because we're of like mind. That's why a church gets together and we study the word of God. And if we believe the model like what we see here, then he raises up various people at various times and this is what we do. But you have to make sure that you recognize you stand before God on what you know of his word and you verify everything that you ever hear so that you'll never be brought into a place of deception. Every person that is a believer can avoid being deceived because you have God's word, which is perfect. Absolutely perfect. And you have the Holy Spirit. And boy, are, are we spoiled. Look at the resources that we have at our, at our fingertips that you could have only dreamed of even 20 or 30 years ago. So God has made it really easy for us. He really has. And I think that that's an interesting little parallel because the more that we see deception coming into the church... Isn't it cool how God has given us the ability to even verify even faster than that stuff can come at us? Isn't that cool? Interesting how that works. Well, as we pick up next week, you're going to notice, look at this. In case any of you leave out of here and go, I'm so nervous now. What if, what if I'm one of these imposters? Or what if somebody that I trust is an imposter or whatever else? Just look at this. But you, Timothy, you've carefully followed my doctrine my manner of life, and then look at this great list of characteristics. Purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. Notice how it stands in total contrast to all the other things that we just read about. The characteristics of the false believer versus the characteristics of the genuine. That's what we'll look at next week. And how do we know how to follow those things? Because we read in verse 16 right here, all scripture is given. 
Praise the Lord. We don't have to lean upon any man. We don't have to lean upon any church, any institution. We lean upon the word of God taught to us through his Holy Spirit by our diligence to seek him out through his word. No way you can be deceived if that's what's happening. Isn't that cool? Thank God for the way he does things. Amen? Let's stand and have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for gathering us here this evening, and we thank you again for your word. You've made these things clear to us. We can have total knowledge and total understanding of your will for us, of what is right, what is wrong. You've given us discernment, and we thank you for that. And even though there are those who would try to dissuade us from, from looking to you in, in the way of discernment, God, you've given us the ability to qualify and to weigh that which is right and even that which is wrong. And we can stand upon the authority of your word, which is perfect. So we thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you that you have gathered us in this place where we could come, brothers and sisters, looking at your word and being encouraged, knowing that as the days grow darker, it is that much more obvious as days go by of the genuineness of our faith that we have in Jesus based upon your word. So again, we thank you. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen? Good night.